to our weekly um, gecko sessions uh, hosted by the Gastro Foundation of Sub-Saharan Africa in association with Project ECHO. My name is Chris Cassinides and I chair the foundation. As you all know, these sessions are held on a weekly basis. And this uh, week's session is devoted to pathology uh, and to the pathology of the lower GI tract. We'll focus, uh, we'll begin our focus with uh, colon polyps and extending to the pathology of inflammatory bowel disease at the next pathology session. The chat is open for questions and we encourage you to uh, post them there. And it's a great pleasure today to welcome uh, our two speakers who return uh, to, to, this, to GECO. Uh, the first is Daniel Surridge, who, is, who heads the colorectal um, uh, section of the Chris uh, Harney Baragwanath Hospital. Welcome, Daniel. It's a great pleasure to have you back. And uh, also hello to our resident pathologist, Martin Hale, who is a professor emeritus at the University of the Witwatersrand. And I'd like to um, welcome, a special welcome to Dr. Dion Levine, who visits us today for the first time, who will chair the session. He's a gastroenterologist in the Department of Gastroenterology at the University of Cape Town, a skilled endoscopist with a particular interest in colonoscopy, the training and upskilling of colonoscopy. Dion, great pleasure to have you here today, and I hope it will be one of many in the future. So I'll hand over to Daniel, who will begin by giving us um, uh, his uh, perspective on colon polyps and endoscopy. Uh, we'll then break, for, I think, for some questions, and then uh, Martin will take over and give us a perspective, a histopathological perspective. Over to you, Daniel. There we go. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, thank you for the introduction. I said, my name is Daniel. I work in, in Joburg at Baraguanath Hospital. And I want to chat to you today about um, polyps and in colonoscopy. There we go. So let's say you're doing your colonoscopy, put in your scope, and you see a polyp. So what now? At this point, there should be a whole bunch of questions going through your head like, what am I looking at? What do I need to do about it? Do I need to do anything about it? Do I have the tools to fix this? Do I need the tools to fix it? Do I have the skills? What's going to happen if I take it out? Am I going to make a hole? Am I going to you know, kill the patient? Am I going to cause issues? Will this lead to untold mayhem? And will I cause an absolute end of the world disaster? Okay. So facing a polyp is not just you know, a benign issue. There's a whole lot of things that through your mind, we need to find some kind of a rational approach to what to do with this situation. So, I'm going to give you my approach. Hi there. <laughs> I'm going to give you my approach. And with that, I think we'll start off just by looking at sort of a small classification on the polyps. Prof Hale is going to go into those a little bit more. He's going to show us some examples of, of a few things and a few things that are outside of the scope of my talk that are going to be a lot more interesting. Um, and then I want to show you a few tools for diagnosing the polyps at endoscopy, for uh, resecting the polyps, and then to put together what to do with these skills and these, these tools that you have at your hands. So first up, what's the risk? So obviously cancer is cancer, we know the risk of that, but pre-malignant polyps really are divided into adenovillus, tubular villus, and tubular adenomas. Your pre-malignant lesions like your sesarcerated lesions or your dysplasia and your IBD, um, and your, your lesions of premaline predisposition, such as hematomas, what do you do with those? Your benign conditions you can basically leave behind. We'll come back to all of this towards the end. So let's have a broad look at the diagnostic tools at our disposal. First up, what we're probably all fairly comfortable with is white light endoscopy. Now, I, I love this slide. I use the slide whenever I possibly can. This is a consent form from our hospital at Donald Gordon and where, where I do some of my RWAPS work. <laughs> and when we take a patient for any procedure, they're asked to write on a consent form what they think is going to be done to them. So my patient wrote on his consent form that we're gonna be going to theater and they're going to be filming a movie up his butt and in his stomach, which I think perfectly sums up 
white light endoscopy. That's exactly what it is. Okay. So going in, you're going to have a look at the camera and see what you can do. With white light endoscopy, what's really too disposable is you see a polyp, you can have a look at the, 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 the morphology of the polyp, and you can probably take it fairly educated, um, you have a fairly educated idea of where in the colon this polyp is. So we have our Paris classification morphology, which shows you as you move along from your type 1 view all the way down to your type 3, you're moving along the more malignant polyps, the more malignant um, potential for those polyps. So, however, once you move beyond white light endoscopy, you have a whole lot of other tools at your disposal. First up is chrome endoscopy. Now, chrome endoscopy, during your, your colonoscopy, you spray the polyp with, or, or the colon with a dye, and you have a look at the pit pattern of that polyp. Kudo put together a pit pattern sort of giving us what is the risk of this polyp going through, and you'll see as you go from one to all the way down to six, your pit pattern will change as your polyp becomes more malignant. If you have a look at type two, we'll come back to this a little bit later, that is the pit pattern for your hyperplastic and your serrated polyps. Type threes move more through to the adenomas, and you're starting to look at type fives when you're getting more uh, malignant lesions. Narrowband imaging, most scopes are, are fixed with this today, whether uh, you're looking at something like device or something like that. Each scope has a different name brand for what's essentially the same, the same issue. Your narrowband imaging shows you the blood vessels that are around or deep to your polyp. That gives you an idea of how malignant your malignant potential of your polyp as well. So if you're looking at something swept from narrowband imaging, it gives you a better idea of what's going on below it. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me, it's only COVID. Um, the Japanese then took all of these ideas, put them together, and gave us the JNET classification. From this, they looked at the narrowband imaging with the vessel pattern over here, your pit pattern with your chrome endoscopy, and they put it together to say, what's the most likely pathology of what you're staring at? And they divided into four groups. Have a look at type one, hyperplastic and cess ulcerated. Type two, you're now looking at more the adenomas and the intramucosal and the aplasias, and then you're hitting the cancers. This gives you an idea of when you're standing there at white light endoscopy with a couple of uh, narrowband imaging tools of disposal, what you might be looking at and dealing with. The Brits then came along, took that JNA classification, simplified it even further, once again, looking at the color of the polyp, the vessels and the surface patterns, and divided it down into your hyperplastic, your adenomas and your cancers. So now you have a nice classification. You can stick it on the wall of your endoscopy room and say, this is most likely what I'm dealing with. I can act with a fair amount of confidence. However, beware. If you have a look at all of these classifications, the cess on the hyperplastic polyps tend to look the same. There are a few things that you can use to try and pull apart. Your cess ulcerated lesions are, tend to be more pre-malignant. Your hyperplastics are happy you can leave them behind, but you really want to get those cess ulcerated out. So your cess ulcerated do tend to be larger. So they're, 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 they're small polyps as opposed to diminutives. They have a mucus cap, and this is what makes them really tricky, is you miss them because you think you've just got a, a little bit of slime in the colon. Go ahead, wash that slime away and see if there's something hiding underneath it. If there's something on the right-hand side of the colon, that's, that should give you a red flag that this is more likely to be serrated lesion rather than hyperplastic. Once you start put that narrowband imaging on them, they do tend to look a little bit different. They've got vasculature at the, at the bottom of those pits that looks slightly, slightly different from your hyperplastics. So if we have a look at it, you have a look, ignore the, the top, the top one here, this one's a little bit confusing, but if you have a look at C and D, when you have a look at this polyp with narrowband imaging, you get these black spots at the bottom of the crypts. With E, you start to get these varicosities of the blood vessels beneath the polyp that starts to show you. This is more likely serrated rather than a, a hyperplastic when you're staring at it with the uh, endoscope. Something I've never used before, confocal micro, laser microendoscopy. This look, looks like quite a fun toy. I think you'd probably take quite a while to learn how to use it. This is a normal endo endoscope and you shove a, a microscope down it and this gives you real time microscopy of the polyp you're looking at. So picture on the left is the polyp you'll get through the in endoscope, picture on the right is the actual histology and you can use that to give you real time microscopy of what your polyp is. I think this requires quite a bit of training, but it's probably quite a useful tool. It has not been found to really make a, any massive difference in outcome, however. We will come to it in a second with AI. So the buzzword at the moment is increasing technology, trying to get more machines to do what we can do so that we can increase accuracy. So artificial intelligence has been brought in to do a couple of things, to try and spot the polyps that we miss and to try and diagnose them in front of us. So recently, the Japanese brought out 
a technique where they would use a, a, a colonoscope. You can see it lights up in the corners to say, there's a polyp, ding, 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 move over to narrowband imaging, go over to a, to a 100 magnification, take three pictures, and it'll tell you what what is this you're dealing with? 99% sure this is a hyperplastic polyp. Don't bother, leave it behind. Same story. We now have a small polyp pulling out of the colon. Ding, 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 ding. You'll get big signs on the side. Oh, there's a polyp over there. Go back and have a look. Switch to narrowband imaging. Put your artificial intelligence onto it and they take three pictures. Now the vasculature looks a little bit different. Computer says, no, nah, this, this is not fun. Take it out. So once again, trying to, to figure out whether this can be better than us or not can be a little bit tricky, but we do know that in terms of identifying polyps and in terms of diagnosing the type of polyp, it seems to actually be equivalent to an expert. So beware, there's computers coming for our jobs. Next, what do we do? Do we take this polyp out or not? So this once again depends on what is your skill. Can you get the polyp out? Do you have the equipment? And can you follow this patient up? So. There's a few tools you can use. Just very quickly going through them. If you've got a really small polyp, like a diminutive polyp, you can actually take it out just with a giant biopsy forcep. If you can get that polyp out in two bites or less, you can take it out with a biopsy forcep and that's all you need to do. If it's slightly larger, you can cold snare it and take it out with a cold snare and that's all, that's all you need to do, take it out. If it's a bit bigger, you can lift it, take it out with a hot snare um, and that'll allow you to cauterize the base of the polyp if it becomes something even slightly larger, you may need to lift it and start doing endoscopic submucosal resections. These can be used for fairly, fairly smallish polyps like this. You can use them for very large polyps. You can take out piecemeal. If you have very large polyps, you can start taking out endoscopic submucosal dissections. This is now becoming very technical, very difficult and quite dangerous. Um, if you're not okay with this, you can then refer it to your friend. You, okay. Before you do that, you can do full thickness resections with devices such as the Avesco full thickness resection device. That'll allow you to take a four centimeter polyp out, place a clip behind and remove the whole thing in one piece for histology. If you're not okay with any of this, send it to your friendly surgeon and your surgeon will happily open your patient up and take out large chunks of bowel. Last thing is to consider what is the best thing for your patient? Will your patient manage what you're doing to them or do they need to, would you rather take a step back and say, this is a sick patient, leave them alone. Um, let nature take its course. Your polyps are less likely to cause an issue than the patient's other problems. So now we've gone through the tools. You've got some tools to have a look at the polyp, diagnose what it might be, and some tools to get it out. And now you actually need to ask yourself the question, do I need to do this? So start with the easy ones first. Large polyps that are larger than nine millimeters, they really should come out. Okay, if they're obviously malignant, looking at your classifications, biopsy them, tattoo distal to the polyps, you come out three centimeters, tattoo in three places, places distal to the polyp, come out, send to your surgeon. If you're in the rectum, do not tattoo because all that happens is your tattoo goes into the planes around the rectum and it's hard to get that rectum out. If it's a pre-malignant lesion, you can either remove the polyp using one of the techniques we've described. If you're not happy to remove the polyp, do not biopsy it. Take a photo of it and send it to someone who is happy to remove that lesion endoscopically. Once you've removed it, send it for histology. If you find that you're trying to remove a polyp endoscopically and it's not lifting, you're not getting it out, beware, don't follow that path down through the bowel. Stop, send the patient off to a surgeon to have it removed. Okay. Then you come across slightly difficult concepts. So something that's come out of the literature in the last sort of six or seven years is the idea of resect and discard. This has come largely because we need to start asking ourselves the question, do small polyps and diminutive polyps all need to be sent for histopathology? So looking at the US data for, I think it was 2018, the histopathology bill for polyp, polypectomies and polyps and biopsies from the colon came to something like 9 billion US dollars. And we need to look at ways to rationalize the spend and whether it really makes a difference to the patient. So what Resect and Discard says is all your small polyps, and that's polyps that are nine millimeters or less, well, between, between sort of six and nine millimeters, resect them. If you think they're pre-malignant, throw them away. You don't need to send them for pathology, they're pre-malignant and they're gone. 
they're not going to be a problem in that patient's future, they're not going to feature. If you are worried that actually your little pre-malignant lesion is possibly malignant, has some in-situ or high dysplasia, that's the polyp you need to send away. And for that reason, we have all of the tests that we've done above. So what's worrisome? This test is, as I said, is used for the polyps that are, that are six to nine millimeters. We now need to decide whether, whether we have enough information at our disposal to make this policy that we can implement this. So the tools we had really that have been assessed is white light endoscopy and narrowband imaging and the site of the polyp. So if your polyp is sitting on the right-hand side, you're far more likely to send it for histology than if it's sitting on the left. If your, if your narrowband imaging shows that this is something that's really a pre you're not you're not unhappy with it, throw it away. Really, this needs to be done by expert endoscopists. This cannot be done by the occasional endoscopist. It's not a decision that they should be making. What is quite interesting is that recent studies, 2019, 2020, and another one from 2021, has shown that using this policy, no intermittent malignancy has been found in these patients with a follow-up. I think it, really, it was about 36 months of these patients. So follow-up endoscopy has shown no intermittent malignancies anywhere. Um, other papers have shown that if you do send these polyps away, examining them from margins or for complete resections makes no difference to the patient. They tend not to recur. So small polyps with an involved margin actually doesn't matter. When you're looking at bigger polyps, sure, you need to know if it's all out, but small polyps, they're gone. They don't come back. Then when you're looking at diminutive polyps, you need to start asking themselves the question, do I even need to take it out? Can't I just leave it behind? If it's a completely benign polyp, like a hyperplastic polyp or an inflammatory polyp, do I honestly need to touch it? So if it's benign, leave it alone. So these tend to be your ones that are five millimeters or less. They're definitely hyperplastic. They're on the left-hand side, rectus sigmoid. Those are the ones that you'll leave in and come back and check on next time because they're not gonna cause you issues in these patients. Interestingly, They've had a look, this has now been around, as I say, for a few years. They've done surveys looking at clinicians and at patients. Surveys done in multiple countries in Europe, UK, well, UK is one country, and the US, have shown that 80% of patients are not comfortable, of, of clinicians, expert clinicians, are not comfortable to do this. They do not feel that we have enough tools at our disposal to make the kind of call to say this is definitely pre-malignant and not malignant. 60% um, of patients of, of clinicians feel that you know, we, we can't do this at the moment, we need better diagnostic tools. When they asked patients what should happen to the polyp that's taken out, 75% of them said they would pay out of their own pocket to have the histology done to give themselves the reassurance that it's pre-malignant and not malignant and that it's all gone and they're fine. What's come out this year is if you think back to that artificial intelligence videos that I showed you, on the diagnostic accuracy of the narrowband imaging and the microscopy that was done in those endoscopies. Those have shown 90, 95 to 98% accuracy for removing these polyps as to whether we should diagnose and leave or resect and discard these small and diminutive polyps. So there's one study that's come out so far showing this might be feasible for the future. We might have found the tool that we need, but the jury is still out. Some people have embraced this wholeheartedly some people have not, but watch the space for the future. They might just be artificial intelligence coming out to show us the way that we need to go. So in conclusion, when you're faced with this patient, you need to assess the risk of the polyp you're looking at, the skills that you have to tackle this polyp, the condition of your patient, and within your framework of what your patient and your health system is to rationalize the management of what you can do for them. Thanks a lot. Thanks very much, uh, Daniel. Excellent presentation. Dion, over to you. There are some questions in the chat which we can answer or any comments. Thanks, Daniel. That was excellent. I just want to um, reiterate what Daniel has said, specifically with regards to is this something that I can deal with? Because when you're going to take a polyp out, the whole point of a polyp removal is that you have to take the whole polyp out if you're going to do it. If you're unable to do that, either you don't feel skilled enough 
or you don't have the requisite equipment, you need to send this patient on to someone who can. There's no point biopsying something unless you think it's a cancer, because when you biopsy a sessile polyp, it causes a fibrotic reaction, and the next person who has to remove the polyp will not get all of the polyp out. Um, in terms of um, in terms of if you can't refer the patient on, if the buck stops with you, then you have to do the best that you can. And it might be speaking about sessile polyps, a piecemeal resection. And just remember that I'm a big advocate of lifting all polyps, except for diminutive polyps, with a methylene blue, adrenaline, and voluven combination. You can use um, indigo carmine as well. It gives you a margin of safety and it allows you to see the whole rim of the polyp, particularly sessile polyps. There can be a whole discussion about cold or hot polypectomy, which may not be relevant now. And in terms of leaving polyps behind, aside from the sort of diminutive fiber epithelial type polyps in the rectum and sigmoid, which Daniel has alluded to, I find it very difficult sometimes to actually know if I should leave this polyp if I should biopsy and discard, and I don't have that answer because you actually have to practice using narrowband imaging and you have to practice using whichever classification you choose to. And I would recommend that you use the simplest classification, the nice classification, which basically, if you've got little dots that look the same as the surrounding mucosa, it's hyperplastic. If it looks like brain tissue, it's adenomatous. And if it's disordered with an ulcer or a little, little pit in it, it's likely to be more advanced. But you need to practice this. And until you are an expert at this, I think it's very difficult to leave polyps behind. And I would not leave polyps behind on the right side of the colon, whether they're hyperplastic or not, as David, as, as Daniel has mentioned. And I mean, things like the Paris classification, we can try and memorize that kind of thing. But I mean, no one remembers these things. So it's best to put this up in your colonoscopy room and just try and practice on every every colonoscopy and see if you if you got it right both the classification as well as the narrowband imaging there's no right answer to this but i think the technique of colonoscopy of, of polypectomy is, is is the issue can you deal with it can you remove the polyp all of it and if i can't what what am i going to do daniel <clears throat> All right, so I'm just um, having a look at the question, sorry, here on the side. Um, uh, yeah, so, the, so the, someone has posted... Sorry, Chris. So yeah, so, um, so a couple of questions. I mean, your preferred solution for lift at uh, EMR? Do you want me to answer, so, Daniel? So if I'm, if oh, sorry, I'm doing sorry. a... Sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah. If I'm doing a, a, just a plain sort of snare, I'll, I'll actually just pop in a little bit of volume in. If I'm doing a, an EMR or an ESD, um, you know, the EMRs are, are easy enough. I, I will put in the, the patent blue or the methylene blue. The, 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 the trick is to sort of, I'll, I'll, I'll pick up a bag of volume in, and usually it's one amp. What I have found is depending whether I'm working in barrel or in private, there tend to be different concentrations in the little amp of patent blue that they bring me. So rule of thumb is if I pick the bag up and I can just see the writing on the other side of the bag, that's blue enough. Um, I'll put in sort of a mill of one in 10,000 adrenaline into that 500 mil bag. If I'm doing an, an ESD, I then add one mil of, of uh, hyaluronic acid. It just seems to hold the, the, um, the liquid in the, the, the submucosal tissues for a bit longer. You can get it as eye drops. It's, it's your, your tears natural. You just buy a, buy a bottle of eye drops, suck a mill of that out and add it in. And it sort of seems to hold that, that blab a little bit longer for you to work if you're working under the tissues. Like I say, if it's a smallish um, polyp that I'm removing, I'd, I'd, I'd go with something that's quick and easy to get out. Dion? I did see a question around um, why the push for I, artificial I, intelligence. I, let's just Sorry, have your Chris. views, Dion, on, on the solution. Oh. Uh, we use an amp of methylene blue, an amp of adrenaline in 500 mils of voluven. We put it in at the start of the list and we keep it for the whole day and we just withdraw as we need it. And our practice is generally to lift every polyp aside from, as I said earlier, from these little diminutive polyps where you can probably biopsy them off with one bite. 
if you need to do them at all. I mean, fortunately, small polyps are not often malignant. Um, and that's what our practice is. Okay, and then there's some questions on AI, and may maybe we can just group them all together. I mean, and, and both uh, Dion and, and Daniel to comment. Let's start with Daniel. Uh, so give us your idea, why the need for AI, um, uh, Daniel? So, so I think that a lot of it's tending towards rationalizing the uses of, of, of um, skills. So there's a, there's a load of polyps out there and there's a lot of people who are, who, are, who are performing endoscopy and it's trying to get the best results, you know, get an expert result for every patient. So artificial intelligence gives you a tool that you can level across the board. Um, it's, it's not going to be, at the moment, not going to be able to provide the expert resections. So it's going to allow you to diagnose the patient. You're going to have to then go ahead and do the, the resection. But what it is going to allow you to do is to have like a setup as you would have in the UK, where you have endoscopy sisters who are then able to carry on, do their endoscopy, have this thing light up, who are trained to sort of do a colonoscopy, have this thing light up, show there's a polyp here, put the, put the scope onto it. So doctor, I've seen this polyp, it's this, what must we do? Then they can decide we need to take this out now. You can have one expert running five colonoscopies at the same time. So it really is a case of trying to maximize the bang for your buck. Um, you're still gonna need those skills to make the decisions. You're still gonna need the skills to get the polyps out, but you're gonna be able to get a whole lot more patients through and a whole lot more better decisions made for these patients. And I think that's where AI is gonna come into its own. Dion? I must say, I haven't done much reading about AI. I don't, I'll just, that didn't really interest me um, foolishly. Maybe I'm a Luddite. But certainly, I think that <laughs> what probably has prompted it is the fact that we generally poor at doing colonoscopy. And there's very little standardized training. And if it helps people recognize which polyps to remove, I suppose there is some value. But as Daniel said, it doesn't detract from the basic principle that you need, need to know what to do and how to do it, because they must still come out. Um, you. You know, I don't know much more than that, sorry. Um, and then there's a comment from Dr. KSC from Dubai. Welcome and hello. And he makes the point that we need three E's, expert eyes and endoscopists. So, and representing virtual Dubai endoscopy forum. Just an, another question that's just been posted. Your thoughts on data suggesting we have low adenoma with our African continent. Is it truly low or is it a skill issue? So are um, adenomas infrequent in Sub-Saharan Africa? Daniel and then Dion. Sure, uh, so this, this is a difficult one. Um, yeah, well, your population in, at Barra, Chris Harney Barra? There's, there, there, there's a combination of issues here. A lot of it is that we have, there is no screening program set up uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa as far as I understand. Um, so that's why we do have this low adenoma protection rate. The, the patients that are being taken through, you know, eventually they're, they're, they're usually symptomatic. They're usually ones who are well advanced, particularly Baraguana. By the time we pick up something, it's, a, it's an advanced cancer. Um, the area that I have a particular interest in is our, our young patients who are coming through with, with disease. And we are seeing very little polyp disease in these patients because basically we're just not looking for it, I think. I think that they have very, very quick disease. So I think there probably are polyps that are just developing so, so quickly, we miss them. And they, they're presenting with very locally advanced cancers that by the time they metastasize, they metastasize incredibly aggressively and they're not responding the way that, that most patients respond to treatment out there. Dion? Um, there's a recent publication by Sandy um, Thompson in the SAMJ about polyps in our population here. I just think that if you're talking about the rest of Africa, I think there's a paucity of data about whether there are adenomatous polyps in that population. Um, and what was the second part of the question? No, it was just how often... Um, yeah, so there is a publication. They can look in the SAMJ. Sandy Thompson, I think the, the first author was J.J. Kruger, 
and they've done an audit of all the polyps at, at um, Krutuskia. Obviously, we have a range of ethnicity here, which is lots of mixed ancestry, white patients. We don't have a lot of black South Africans, but there are there is data in this article about what we found. I don't remember it off the top of my, my, head, my head. Thanks very much. Sorry, Martin, uh, Martin Hell, I didn't see your hand up, but uh, yeah, un unmute and, and, and tell us. So, so thanks, uh, Chris. Thanks, Daniel and uh, Dion. Great, great comments. I'd just like to comment. Uh, Freeze. Martin? And he's our next speaker, so <laughs> we can't yeah. move on. Mission should be followed and... Uh, sorry, Martin, we missed, we missed a lot of that. If you could just start again. Um, sorry, yes, I was just saying thanks to Daniel and, and Dion. Uh, great talk and uh, comments from, from Dion. Um, but uh, just to... Uh, in colonoscopy reminds me very much of uh, the same technology which is being used by dermatologists for the following uh, you know if you take people for example uh, with uh, dysplastic nevus syndrome and these people can have uh, you know many many hundreds of pigmented lesions so they take photographs and and watch them and use dermoscopy to follow them. And it works very well. Thank you. And then look, finally, uh, uh, Julian Utley, uh, if, you, if, if you could um, perhaps unmute as well, you have an interesting uh, mm. comment. Well, this was <clears throat> a study I did. Uh, Julian, just introduce yourself because uh, you know many of us don't know you and... Um... Well, I... <laughs> I spent the better part of my career at uh, Helen Joseph doing uh, as much colorectal disease as I could manage and have been happily retired for the last four or five years. Um, but round about 1920, uh, sorry, 20 years ago, so not 1920, about 2000, I had a look at all the cases that I dealt with of large bowel cancer at Helen Joseph looking specifically for associated polyps in those patients where we had examination of the entire colon. And it was round about 30 plus percent in white patients and 6% in black patients. So, you know, that's uh, a specific subset of patients who have already developed cancer, but there was a clear differentiation. Okay, thanks very much. Any final comments before we turn to histopathology? Uh, Chris, I see, I see there's a question on why yeah. don't we have a screening program? Do you want to deal with that or not? Uh, this no, we can. Sure. Sure. No, 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 go ahead. Um, we've still got some time. Look, I mean, very few countries in the world have proper screening colonoscopy programs. The, probably the leader in the world is the UK, but that's not random people coming in for colonoscopies. They have a whole fecal immunohistochemistry testing, immunohistochemistry testing uh, program where you send off, where stool is sent to people and they send it back by mail and they do a number of tests and then they're invited in. But the screening program relies on expert colonoscopists, the ability to see polyps, right? Which is, a, which is relative to your bowel prep mm -hmm. and then to know what to do with those polyps and remove them completely if you want to see positive outcomes. And in fact, a screening program, you need to do like 260 colonoscopies to stop one death from cancer or something along those lines. So it's not a particularly effective screening program amongst millions and millions of people. I think people should concentrate more on the basics of colonoscopy. Can I do a proper colonoscopy? Can I identify polyps properly? And is the bowel prep good? Because it all comes down to that. And I, and I don't want to simplify things because I don't know what people's practices are in the 12 countries that are represented, represented here. I can only speak for my practice. And we hadn't even addressed those issues before we start worrying about AI and chromo endoscopy and screening programs. Thanks. Can, can I make a quick comment here as well? Of course, Daniel. 
I think one of the major issues, if you have a look at the data around the screening programs from, from Europe and the UK, like it, it, is, it is one of the few diseases on the planet where you can impact mortality with a, with a screening, a properly implemented screening program. Um, just using, using the sort of rationalized program that, that, that they've been using in the UK with fecal alcohol blood follow and, and teasing that out into, into colonoscopy. And yes, they have a lot of experience. They, have it, they definitely have it well set up. But one of the basics that we're lacking here is we actually don't even know incidence. We don't know in our population, looking at Prof Whitley's data, looking at what we're seeing, whether this is, whether this is going to have an impact in our population at all. You know, the, our incident data is, there's some of it, but it's not that reliable. If we were then to go to the funders and say, now we need to, to put in um, a screening program and then we want to assess results, we actually can't, can't assess what we're doing. Um, that and you, know, you send your fecal alcohol blood test through the post, we don't actually have a functional postal service. So I think that we're, we're lacking a few things and I agree completely with, with Dion. We need to get the basics in place first and it's, it's healthcare systems as well as you know, uh, clinicians. So just and finally, there are some more questions. I think we should take them after the pathology, but just is the virtual program, is the virtual medium suited to upskilling colonoscopy, Dion? You mean sitting in a, in a room elsewhere? Well, sitting on this, on this, I mean, in using this kind of forum. I think to a certain extent it is, but unfortunately one of the, problems with endoscopy is that the person has to have their hands on the scope, on the snare, on the injection needle. And uh, I think the, the responsibility is of, in South Africa certainly is with the, with the academic centers. If we are reasonably good colonoscopists and we can know how to teach colonoscopy, then that will be dispersed into private practice and, and other areas. And that's what we've tried to do. Um, with our upskilling colonoscopy courses, which obviously have been stopped because of the problems over the last 18 months. I don't know oh, if Daniel yeah. wants to comment on that. Yeah, definitely. Daniel? I'd, I'd actually agree with Dion. I think that you, know, you can teach so much, but you have to be in there doing it. Thanks a lot. Martin, there are some more questions. I mean, how much time did you want for the pathology? Should we move on to the pathology and perhaps take questions later? The remaining questions. I can, uh, I can go through the path uh, pretty quickly. Okay, maybe we'll turn to the pathology and any remaining questions at the end, if you'll allow us. I'm okay. sorry about that. And it's very nice for the interest, but I think we need to keep on time. So Martin, thank you. Right, so uh, thanks very much uh, once again for inviting me to, uh, to talk this afternoon. I certainly enjoy the sessions and, and also enjoy the, you know, the sort of clinical interaction and and hearing the problems that, and uh, comments that, that everybody makes. So uh, I'm going to take you through a selection of, um, of polyps uh, that uh, really just come across my microscope in the last few months. And, uh, and we're going to end off with the hyperplastic and the serrated polyps. So the first one then is, uh, is this one. Can everybody see my screen? That's yeah. a it's great. All right, so this is just an incidental uh, finding. In fact, it wasn't really an incidental finding. It was a 42-year-old man who, who underwent uh, colonoscopy. Uh, his background medical history was that he had ethanol-induced cirrhosis, so he was undergoing a surveillance uh, screening procedure. And uh, white or, or pale uh, lesions were identified uh, in the rectum. And uh, this is a pretty typical picture. And uh, not, you don't see them very often. So I thought I would, would show it to you. And uh, you can see that we've got a portion of, um, of large bowel mucosa. And then when we look in the lamina propria, um, well, first of all, you, just to go through it routinely, just to show you that the architecture of these glands is okay. You have fairly regular glands. There's a little bit of irregularity, which is fine for the rectum. Um, but uh, in the lamina propria, you've got this focal expansion uh, of the lamina propria by a cellular infiltrate. And uh, when you have a look at it, uh, one can see that there are lots of foamy histiocytes here with small little nuclei, um, usually centrally located. And then uh, elsewhere uh, through the rest of the uh, 
the lamina propria, you can see these similar histiocytes there. I present this really for a, for a couple of reasons. First of all, um, because this is quite a subtle uh, finding and easily missed. You can see similar histiocytes there, and there are also histiocytes there. Now, in, a, uh, in the Northern Hemisphere, for example, uh, one would uh, probably make the first diagnosis, and that is the correct diagnosis of a, of a rectal xanthoma, uh, which indeed this is. But in our part of the world, uh, the differential diagnosis uh, extends beyond that. And certainly you would have to make sure that the patient is not immunocompromised and maybe has an opportunistic infection such as an atypical mycobacterial infection or, or something similar. And, uh, you know, uh, one should not miss uh, these, uh, uh, these clusters of, of histiocytes, but certainly it's very easy, for example, uh, to overlook uh, the histiocytes, for example, the same histiocytes that are sitting there. You can see those. So on a busy sort of uh, practice, uh, Friday afternoon, for example, very easy to, to miss that. So that's a rectal xanthoma, and uh, it has, it's perfectly benign and uh, has no relationship whatsoever to uh, any abnormal lipid profile. Uh, the gender, there's no gender predilection or predisposing factors. So that's a, that's a nice sort of unusual case. Then the next patient uh, is uh, a patient who um, is a 56-year-old man, and uh, he was known to have uh, mesenteric vascular uh, thrombosis, presented with, uh, with GI symptoms, lower GI symptoms. And uh, what we have here is uh, we have two portions of uh, large bowel mucosa, it's actually rectal tissue again, a little bit of variation in uh, the gland size. I want to come back to this area here. And then in this region here, the diagnosis is, uh, is readily apparent. And uh, one can see that uh, you've got uh, fairly extensive superficial ulceration uh, of the mucosa with underlying granulation tissue. Uh, we've got uh, a slips of smooth muscle extending up from the muscularis mucosae into this granulation tissue, acute on chronically inflamed uh, cells there as well. And then when we look uh, at this region here, you can see that uh, the glands appear somewhat irregular. Uh, they're angulated, but note that the uh, nuclei are basally orientated. There's no evidence of uh, stratification. And if one looks here, you can see that you've got the beginnings of a cystically dilated gland. I think it's important to note that the, this change is, uh, is present entirely within the uh, mucosa. The submucosa is probably round about here, or, or the muscularis is round about here. So this is not a submucosal dilatation. And uh, this is a solitary rectal ulcer or rectal prolapse uh, syndrome. Also an important uh, condition to identify because uh, endoscop endoscopically, it can mimic a malignancy and also histopathologically, the unwary can be uh, tricked into calling this an infiltrating adenocarcinoma because of the architectural changes. And there it's uh, relatively straightforward. But when we come across here, for example, you can see that we've got quite a lot of atrophy of these glands, uh, this sort of thing here. You can see the desmoplasia and that around these, uh, these crypts. You can see the irregularity of, to the epithelium, but notice that although there are regenerative changes to this epithelium, there are insufficient uh, nuclear features to warrant a diagnosis of malignancy. So it's a, a, a trap uh, for the unwary histopathologist and um, yeah, uh, uh, but a pretty classic example of, uh, of solitary rectal ulcer. And here you can see once again these slips of smooth muscle in the lamina propria and the desmoplasia. Right, then we're going on to one patient now. The next uh, set of biopsies is all from one patient, which is in a way uh, fortuitous, but uh, almost a sort of a polyp museum, if you like. Um, amazing, in fact, that one patient can have so many uh, different types of polyps. But the first one, uh, he is a, um, he's a young chap, he's 31 years of age, 
uh, and he presented with lower GI symptoms and uh, underwent uh, um, uh, upper and lower uh, colonoscopy. Sorry, uh, endoscopy of the upper and lower GI tract. Now, the first biopsy that I want to show you is a biopsy from the sigmoid colon. And uh, as I said, he's, he's 31. Uh, keeping on the in inflammatory um, the inflammatory theme, you can see that uh, what we have here, portion of tissue, and we've got uh, this extensive ulceration. And uh, one can see under low power, you've got um, uh, granulation tissue. We'll look at that uh, more closely. And then immediately beneath that, uh, we've got these um, glands, glandular structures, which are lined by mucus secreting uh, mucosal epithelial cells. So let's have a look at this here. And you can see that uh, a typical zonal appearance uh, with uh, fibrin debris on the surface, together with uh, inflammatory cells, predominantly acute inflammatory cells, uh, immediately beneath the fibrin. And then moving down, you can see this, uh, this uh, proliferation of uh, endothelial cells, for example, there, uh, gradually forming capillaries, and the capillaries are gradually forming uh, larger blood vessels. So if you think about your third year pathology and everything that, uh, that we learned then, the typical uh, zonal appearance of organizing granulation tissue. I'd like to come down here then, you can see that some of these vessels are now starting to become uh, quite thick walled as you see there. And then uh, looking at these glandular structures, you can see that many of them are lined by goblet cells and mucin secreting cells. Notice that they are cystically dilated. And that's a feature of this. And this is what we call an inflammatory cap polyp, uh, which is associated with idiopathic inflammatory bowel disease. It's typically found on the, uh, on the, uh, the, the tops of the mucosal folds. It can also be found in association uh, with, the, um, with surgical anastomoses. And a fairly typical picture uh, and uh, really quite a nice example. In fact, it's a classic example. From our point of view with our HIV positive population, obviously when you see vascular lesions such as this, you need to just make sure that you're not, not dealing with something like uh, GI Kaposi sarcoma. Um, but yeah, pretty classic uh, um, uh, inflammatory cap polyp. Uh, then the next one, So this is the same patient, and this was called a diminutive polyp. And uh, once again, we see these from time to time. And uh, you can see that uh, the, um, the large bowel mucosa is here. And with reference to the, to the rest of the slides I'm going to show you, I'd just like you to just uh, photograph and park away in your occipital cortices what the normal colonic mucosa would look like. A regular uh, uh, colonic crypts, uh, regular in size. Notice that uh, the, um, the luminal diameter is the same, roughly from the orifice down to the actual uh, depth of the crypt. This is just, in fact, here, for example, you can see the muscularis mucosae. Uh, you can see that the crypts extend all the way down to the muscularis, so there's no evidence of atrophy. You can see the regular uh, appearance of these crypts is no, no lateral budding or branching or anything like that. The reason why this had a polypoid appearance was because of this intramucosal uh, lymphoid uh, uh, follicle with a germinal center, and uh, that appeared uh, slightly polypoid. So yeah, please just remember uh, what that looks like, because it's going to be important uh, when we come to the, to the next polyps. Right, so now the same patient, and this was a polyp that was situated uh, in, the, uh, in the rectum. It was pedunculated. And uh, here, just wait for the picture to build. So unfortunately, that's as low as I can go. That's the two times lens. 
So it's a fairly large polyp, uh, but we'll start here and you can see that um, it's uh, very cellular, it's very crowded. You can see that uh, we've got this uh, villus appearance. Um, it's blue, okay, so it's intensely blue. And when one picks this up and looks at it macroscopically, you can have a pretty good stab uh, at the diagnosis just by looking at the section before you put it under the microscope. And then in some areas, uh, one can see that there is more of a glandular pattern, for example, there. So this would be a tubular pattern. And uh, if we just stay here, you can see that uh, the, uh, the nuclei in these glands uh, show stratification. Um, you can see the stratification, which is, is um, limited to the lower half of the, of the glandular uh, outline. It's all in the lower half. There's loss of mucin production. There's still a few goblet cells. And there's a little bit of mitotic activity. Uh, for example, you can see the mitosis uh, situated there. You can see that many of the cells have uh, multiple little uh, nucleoli, uh, basophilic uh, nucleoli, quite characteristic. And this is a tubular villus adenoma, and it is showing low-grade dysplasia. All tubular villus, at least all tubular adenomas, uh, villus adenomas, and the mixed variant, the tubular villus adenomas, by definition, are always dysplastic. Um, and here you can see uh, the appearance, see if I can find a better area. There we are. So here you can see the villus architecture, which is, which is quite characteristic. So this biopsy was snared uh, and removed. So tubular villus adenoma with low grade dysplasia. Right, so now we're going to go on to uh, the serrated lesions. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to show you a little article that I came across, uh, and I hope it, uh, it uh, comes across. So I'm going to do a new share. And uh, this uh, um, came from uh, the Department of Medicine at... Um, Denver, Colorado, uh, by the authors there. And uh, this was just a re their opinion on serrated lesions. And when Daniel and I uh, were talking earlier on, I've just uh, sort of um, uh, highlighted, in fact, uh, which, which, which sums up my sort of uh, thoughts of serrated lesions. So they hang out in a, a bad neighborhood, which is the poorly prepped right colon. Uh, Dion's mentioned that. They hide, hide behind a mask of mucus. They are difficult for witnesses, in other words, pathologists, to identify. They are difficult for the police or the endoscopist to find them. They're difficult to remove from society. In other words, they have a high incomplete resection rate. They can be impulsive and progress rapidly to colorectal carcinoma. And the enforcers, in other words, the gastroenterologists, don't know how best to control them. There is no wonder that there is a need to understand these lesions well, learn how best to pre prevent the colonic mucosa from going down this errant path, or if that fails to detect these, these deviants and eradicate them from colonic societies. These lesions should be on the endo endoscopist's most wanted list. So there you are. I hope that uh, <laughs> you could see that. So this then, uh, let's just, uh, just check that you can see the screen. So this is the same patient. And uh, this was a lesion in the, uh, in the transverse colon. Right, can everybody see the histology? Chris, can you see the histology? Yeah, sure. Clear. Okay, so, so what we've got here, and, uh, you know, certainly, I mean, I can certainly echo the words of, uh, of that article, uh, because when I'm faced with these serrated lesions, you sort of uh, take a deep breath and say, right, let's go to the literature, let's try and sort out what this is. And in fact, the serrated lesions remind me uh, very much of, uh, of the 
and I, I'm, it's, it's dating me somewhat, but that's fine. But the original classification of glomerulonephritis, glomerulonephritis, uh, as some of us who will have been around the block a few times will remember that it was a real nightmare to actually understand. And eventually, as histopathologists, we kind of worked out how glomerulonephritis worked, and now it's, it's easy. But it seems as though serrated lesions in the bowel are doing exactly the same thing from when they were originally identified a couple of decades ago uh, to now, and we're still really sorting them out. And it is aided a little bit by the, by the identification of the molecular pathways. So this is a biopsy then of transverse colon. And what you've got here, and I asked you to remember uh, that uh, photograph of the, um, uh, of the normal uh, colonic mucosa. And here you can see these serrated lesions, no, uh, notice or serrated glands, notice the irregularity. You can see the serration here. And in fact, uh, for those of you uh, who know, many of you will, the sort of subclassification of the hyperplastic polyps, you get the, um, the microvesicular and the goblet cell ones. And this is a goblet cell rich uh, polyp. And here you can see the serration. That's uh, well demonstrated there as well. Now, the other thing as well is that <coughs> Uh, our sort of interpretation of these is a little bit complicated by the fact that you really need good orientation uh, of the biopsy to actually see the architecture. But here you can see that the serration is confined to the superficial aspects, whereas the basal aspects, there is no evidence of serration. And that's a very important point uh, to, uh, to take home from a histopathologist's point of view. You can see that the serration is there's the serrated gland at the top. There's no serration down there. And then if we look at this other area here, which is where I've put my dot, and I'm sorry that there's a bit of a score across the, across the slide here, but uh, this is actually the best section to, to demonstrate what we call the funnel-shaped appearance to the crypt. In other words, the opening of the crypt is wider uh, than the depth of the crypt. And this demonstrates that you've got the serration there. You can see the luminal dilatation of the crypt and the narrowing down as you progress towards the uh, muscularis, uh, which is best represented there. And if I go under low power, uh, you can see that uh, they demonstrated. Notice the serration once again on the surface and not uh, in the base of the lesion. And also you can draw a line, for example, uh, down uh, 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 wider at the top uh, than at the bottom, very much like a, a, a normal funnel. So the funnel-shaped uh, crypt then that is characteristic of the hyperplastic polyp. Now I want to move briefly to show you the inner histochemistry to show you this is just what the um, what we do uh, for uh, the inner histochemistry for the mismatch repair genes, and this is really just to demonstrate. Uh, it to you and to show you this is uh, immunohistochemistry for uh, MLH1 and uh, it just uh, shows in fact so there's the serrated polyp there and uh, you can see that you've got good strong nuclear expression of MLH1 and the other markers will show similar uh, changes similar expression so there's no evidence of mismatch repair um, uh, silencing in this particular polyp. So the same patient then, now this was a polyp in the ascending colon. So uh, this is right side. So as the article said, and everybody has alluded to, polyps on the right side need to be, um, need to be handled with caution. And I think this is a particularly interesting one because I discussed this at length with a couple of other people in the department, um, because it really was, uh, in, in, certainly from, from my point of view, uh, quite, an, quite an instructive one, particularly from the point of view of recent developments. So if we look, for example, at this area here. So we can see that the crypts are relatively regular. You can see that the serration, which is goblet cell rich, uh, is predominantly situated in the, at the superficial aspects. But if you look down here, you can see the beginnings of serration down at the bottom and there as well. 
And there was a body of opinion just to call this a hyperplastic polyp. But if you look there, the same sort of thing, you can see the serration here, serration here, and the beginnings of serration there, and possibly also there. What I want to do now is show you this area here, because this area here shows very different features compared to the hyperplastic polyp. You can see that the crypt here is no longer funnel shaped. It is dilated. And in fact, one of the articles that, uh, um, uh, you know, one of the histopath articles talks about uh, colonic crypts on steroids. And you can see that these are dilated. And you can see that it's got luminal dilatation, not only at the surface, but also in the, in the, in the basis of the crypt as well. The other thing that is also important is to show you how the serration is extending to the base of the crypt. And there you've got serration right at the base of the crypt there. So that is extremely worrying. And in fact, if you come across here, you can see that the same sort of thing, for example, in this crypt here as well, you can see the serration, <clears throat> excuse me, there, and you can see the serration there. And then lastly, to show you this area here, Just wait for the picture to build. And if you look here, the same sort of picture, and then you can see this lateral extension there of that particular crypt there, which is also extremely concerning. And as I recall, there, was, there were a couple of others, for example, down here as well. Um, I did see it earlier on, but that's that certainly is, is the best one, which I, which I put that dot next to. So this was interesting because this then is a sessile serrated lesion. So we've changed the, the terminology now using the, the new WHO classification. Uh, and we've done away with sessile serrated adenoma and sessile serrated polyp. And if this is a right-sided lesion as this is, it's best regarded as what we now call a sessile serrated lesion. And what is important is that there is a a slight difference of opinion. The question is how many of these serrated lesions like this with this lateral extension are you allowed before you call it a sessile serrated lesion? Some people have said two and other people have said one. So I've hung my hat on this particular case with the extension of the serration down to the base. We've got the, uh, we've got the lateral extension which indicates the basal proliferative activity of the cells. So this is, a, a, I think, a classic uh, sessile serrated uh, lesion in the right side of the colon. And it could well have originated from a previous hyperplastic polyp, but we're not going to know that. Thanks, Chris, that's it. Excellent. One and question. Just... Hmm. No, carry on. I was just going to mention that the mismatch of their genes, there was no evidence of, uh, mis of uh, silencing either in this. Thanks, Martin. Excellent. So one question, uh, is dysplasia regarded as cancer? And will you comment on high-grade dysplasia, carcinoma in situ, et cetera, the differentiation? Uh, okay, so, so let's take it from the, from the tubular villus lesions. So those, those lesions that are, that are following the um, uh, that, that are following the APC pathway, in other words, chromosome 5, uh, those lesions we distinguish between a high and low-grade dysplasia. Uh, I showed you the low-grade dysplasia, high-grade dysplasia, where you get a lot more mitotic activity, uh, greater muse and loss, uh, and you also get uh, evidence of, of party wall sharing and that sort of thing uh, in, in the polyps. Um, I personally don't really distinguish between high-grade dysplasia 
and sort of cast no more inside you, but I need to be careful with my words because I don't want to confuse everybody with so-called intramucosal carcinoma, which is an infiltrating lesion. Um, but hydrate dysplasia and, and carcinoma in situ in a tubular villus adenoma, I think there's, it's a moot point, but I think it is clearly a different, a different beast to intramucosal carcinoma, where you see a, a definitive infiltration. Dysplasia Another question is, how often do you perform immunohistochemistry to exclude MMR gene mutations on serrated lesions? So Specifically, I do it, those with convincing hyperplastic polyp morphology. So uh, I do it as a rule on all of them um, because of the apparent rapid progression. And I think you need to pick up those where there's mismatch repair deficiency, particularly those patients who, who may have Lynch syndrome. And if I could just touch on dysplasia and the serrated lesions, you don't see much uh, serration in the dysplasia uh, sorry, we don't see much dysplasia in the serrated lesions, but the opinion has been expressed that that's probably because they progress rapidly. Okay. I so think just to, con carry to on con first. conclude, uh, Dion, there's some remaining chat questions. Do you want to take them? Um, uh, size you of diminutive polyps? Just small. I mean, three millimeters, two millimeters. I mean, the, the, the point is that small polyps in general are not carcinomatous. And so you can kind of rest assured that if you just biopsy them off, you'll be okay. In terms of the APCing of the edges, hopefully you won't need to do that with a normal polyp unless you're doing a large sort of spreading lesion uh, EMR type thing. What I do is I just, outside the plastic sheath of the snare, I just put the sort of, tip of the snare out and then I use a bit of coag on the edges or I just do a cold biopsy of the edge if there's any tissue left behind. I don't change to APC but I suppose you could use APC although it's quite superficial APC. Um, and was there anything else? Well, this important question of these diminutive polyps in the rectum that you take out, and then one pops out as a neuroendocrine, you know, an isolated carcinoid, which is not yeah, uncommon. Ne I've never got my head around that. I must be honest. Someone else may have a better opinion than me. Daniel? So um, just as a rule of thumb, the neuroendocrines, the lower down the GI tract you go, the, the more aggressive they are. So I would tend to want to get them out, um, even, if, even if they're little. You, you, sometimes you're, you're, you're chasing nothing, but it's, it's just the, the rectal and the colonic neuroendocrines, once, it's, once you get past the appendix, they're usually not friendly lesions. So rather, rather get them out, particularly if they're small. And then finally, use of argon, APC, to touch up borders and also for small sessile polyps. Maybe Daniel and then Dion. I did mention that earlier, but Daniel can oh, did you? comment. Yeah, but Daniel, okay. you can comment as well. I think, I think Dion's addressed that. Um, it's, it's nice if you've got it. Um, it's, it's at least fairly, fairly safe, a lot safer than trying to do a hot biopsy. Um, but you know, all you're basically doing is, is destroying, destroying tissue with it. I've, I've, not, I've not had any experience with that. I think, I think Dion's approach makes more sense. All right, well, time's up and uh, thank you very much to our speakers and I hope you'll return. And Dion, thank you very much. Sorry, I sort of took over the chairmanship, but um, it was very nice to have you and I hope that uh, we see you back again uh, to drive this important issue. We had 74 registration from 12 countries. So thanks to everyone and to ECHO um, at the University of New Mexico and ECHO India team who support us technolo technologically. Uh, the recordings, remember, all these sessions are recorded and are posted on the Gastro F uh, Foundation website for you to, to go through at your leisure. Thanks very much to Cheryl and Karen at the Foundation for all their support. And to our sponsors, Takeda, uh, Aquino, Amgen, Equity, Aspen, Atco, Ingram. And I look forward to welcoming you back next week for patient blood management with Vernon Lowe. Uh, please stay safe, stay well. Um, good night, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Goodbye.